All right, here tonight on the Five for Fighting podcast, uh, back in the swing of things after I've been gone for about a month, uh, we have a guy who really came on my radar early in terms of the the fighting and you know being the tough guy role and really loves to hype up the crowd, and that is one Mr. Cole Frazier of the Toledo Walleye. Cole, how you doing tonight, man? Good, how are you? Good. I appreciate you taking the time to come onto the podcast and uh, talk some hockey and, uh, you know, get... Get, get your take on everything in your first year in Toledo. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, my first year in Toledo was one to remember for sure. Um, I mean, my ECHL career was a little bit tougher than most. Um, my first year ended up being COVID year, so it got canceled halfway through the year. Um, and then going into the season after that, it was kind of more of a just, you know, 13 teams playing in the league, just trying to find a place to play here, there, basically everywhere I played for three teams. And then I found a, a full-time home last year. And, you know, that really, uh, that really sat at home because it was, it was one of those first full years with a team organization that uh, had given me a chance to play. And, and uh, you know, it was a great group of guys and we made a long run, but came up just a little bit short, but it was a great season. And I love that place to have go back next year. Absolutely, man. Um, well, you know, before we kind of get into your ECHL career, I, I always like to ask the guys. So you were born in, in Ottawa, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Um, so were you a typical Canadian kid? You start off like as soon as you could walk, you're on skates or were you a late bloomer at all? No, as soon as I could basically walk, I was playing. Um, I mean, my parents always said, well, especially my mom, she goes, I, I think you were playing hockey in my stomach when you when I was pregnant with you. So it was kind of, I was just kind of running around inside there, but yeah, I've been playing as long as I can remember. And, um, we have some land back home. So my dad would always make an outdoor rink in the winter. So we'd have that going on too. Oh man, that's the, I'm always jealous of that. Cause you know, I, I love playing hockey. I'm terrible at it though. You know, I'm D league bender, but I would love to sit there and just be able to go out in the backyard and play hockey. Um, yeah, my dad had the street lights. Um, like those big industrial street lights for late night hockey. And we played till the early morning, early hours in the morning, especially on Christmas and New Year's. Those were two big nights and we'd have friends over and they'd come out and they'd skate with us. And um, my sister played a little bit of hockey too. And um, she ended up stopped playing a few years back, but she, her and I would go out there and play in the, uh, in the night with my dad too sometimes. So it was a good, it was a good time. Right on, man. Um, well, you actually ended up getting drafted into the OHL. You know, how did that come about for you? Um, you know... Go ahead. Oh, I was just sorry. I thought you were about to say something. Um, yeah. So was it was it kind of something that was a goal of yours from early on just to kind of excel? Or were you just kind of having fun and then somebody uh, – because I've heard about – I've talked to guys before where they're like, out of nowhere, you know, the dub or the OHL came out. And they're like, yeah, you want to come to camp? And they're like, what the, <laughs> what the hell, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, well, in Ottawa, in that area, there's a uh, there's a camp or there's a league called the uh, CCHL, which is just Tier One Junior A, um, and they kind of do like a protections agent, like a protections thing and um, draft and everything a year before the OHL, so they give you that chance to uh, to go play there, um, and then obviously take that road and go to school, but. Um, you know, I was protected by them and, um, and then I got the call saying that I was drafted to the Pete's in the third round. And they wanted me to come up for a uh, press conference on that day. And, um, it was only two hours, two and a half hours to the rink from my front door. So I was like, let's go. So we went up there and, um, they ended up, uh, giving me a contract in April of that year, um, kind of just after, um, the draft it, they were like, you can come play next year um, and so on. So I signed there. And um, I mean, my junior career was a little, it was a little bit tough um, just in, in ways of being in a spot that was, I mean, I definitely produced my second year. My first year was a little bit tougher. Um, just a lot of moving parts in that aspect. And then kind of going from, solidify myself as like that tough guy and you know you don't always want to be put in the role of a tough guy tough guy because you can play like I know myself I can play the game I mean I play forward for 11 years I'm versatile I can do all that sort of stuff and um, I can definitely throw down when I need to and 
Um, so going into junior career, it was kind of tough because the OHL dropped their fight count down to three. So I couldn't really do that. Um, so that's, that's kind of why I left early. I didn't play my overage year and I just went straight to the coast, but, um, my junior career was second year. We made a nice run for it, went to the conference final. Um, and then the years after that, we were kind of just, uh, you know, bottom feeders kind of just trying to grind it out and get through the years and everything. But, um, you know, it made me grow a lot as a person and, and matured enough to be able to go play pro as a 20 year old. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, and you actually ended up getting drafted by Detroit. We you know what, what kind of feeling was that for you? I mean, it was a, it was an interesting feeling for sure. Um, my agent, my family and I, and my, um, went down to the, uh, the draft is in Chicago that year. And, uh, we went to my agent and I actually had just gone to the bathroom. They were like, New Jersey, just call the timeout. We got five minutes. We can go to the bathroom. So we get there and, uh, um, we walk in and go into the bathroom. We start walking out and then they announced my name and I came running down the tunnel and see my dad, and gave my mom and dad a hug and went down. And it was just a crazy feeling because, um, my captain, um, my captain was, uh, hold on. Sasha, stop. I got my two <laughs> shepherds in here with me. Oh, yeah. Thank um, God. Well, that's one of the reasons I haven't been able to podcast in so long. My wife's been traveling for work and we just got a new German short hair pointer and he's just balls to the wall all the time. So it's like, oh, yeah. Can't have yeah, we got, <laughs> yeah, we have a one year old shepherd and a two year old shepherd. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're in full, full, in full force right now. They're ready <laughs> to go outside and play. But uh, yeah. So, um, it was kind of cool because my captain in Peterborough, we were both drafted at the same, uh, he was drafted the same year as I was. I was drafted the same year he was. And uh, he ended up getting picked in Detroit um, in the third round. So he was already up there in the press box um, talking with everyone. So when I got up there, he was like, no way. And it was kind of cool. You got to see a familiar face. And um, I mean, it was awesome. Yeah, no, that's, that's sweet, man. Um, and you, you talk about it before with the OHL, you, before we get into your ECHL career here, um, you know, you, you brought it up with the, with, with kind of like finding the groove of the tough guy role. Did that, was that something that started for you in Bantam or did you kind of, was it, cause I know some guys when they get to junior, you're like, okay, I got to stand out. I got to do something and guys will start fighting a bit more. Um, so was that something that was always part of your game or did that develop later on? Um, my first fight was in the OHL. Um, I'd never fought before that. Um, so it was kind of just like a heat of the moment thing. I fought a guy named Johnny Cornell. Um, and I remember my parents were actually at that game. My mom hated it because she'd never <laughs> seen me play before. So she was at the game and I guess my dad said she hid behind him because she didn't, she didn't know what it was all about. And, you know, my, my uncle, um, played in the OHL was used to fight Ty Domi all the time. And, uh, his brother played in the NHL and uh, for the Hartford Whalers and his crew came up short a little bit just because of an injury. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was more of a kind of heat of the moment. I was like, hmm, I'm good at this. Like I can, I can make a run with this and kind of get to the next level with it, hopefully. Um, but also know like I can still play the game and produce. Um, so it's kind of like a fine line. Like, you know, there's these guys who can, all they can do is fight and that's kind of their whole role. But for myself, I like to see myself as a two way player. I mean, I can play both. I can be that tough enforcer when you need me to, but I can also play the game. No, and that's it. That's a, that's what's so it's in 2022. It's pretty, very valuable to have that in the game. And I think the game has far surpassed the days of, you know, having the guy that plays those two minutes a night mm -hmm. and um, what have you. And but I, I got to ask. So, you know, even though it might not be your sole purpose is just a strictly an enforcer, because obviously, like I said, you have to play the game as well. Do you like the 10 fight rule at all? I, I ask guys that play in the coast that all the time. Um, I mean, like I've fight. never maxed it. I think it's a good amount. I think it's enough to show that you are willing to throw down and really willing to do that stuff. But I mean, at the same time, it's also um, you're also at that point where it's like, you're preserving yourself. I mean, back in the day when guys were fighting 30, 40, 50 times a season, I mean, you look at them now and there's so much going on with your brain and um, all the information that's coming out with concussions and everything. Um, 
I mean, it's, it's serious. It's a, it's a big problem. Um, but I mean, the 10 fight, I think is perfect. I mean, for myself, I think I get to like that seven, eight mark every year, but you know, I find, um, if I were to go higher than that, if I was getting into like the 13, 14, 15, I mean, my hands and my head would just be, um, just be mangled. I mean, my hands are bad enough as it is just off the eight fight rule, um, or just having eight fights a year. Um, right. But I mean, I think it's a good number. I think it, it forces people to actually have to be able to play. So it's not just a, it's not just a run around and fight, you know, I mean, fighting is a part of the game. It will always be part of the game. And I'm a firm believer on that. Um, and that's just, I mean, you can't have guys running around taking cheap shots at your, at your skilled players, at your top guys and not have to answer the bell. But I think the time for fighters going out and fighting each other every single night, I think that that, that part of the game is slowly coming out of it, but the having to stick up for your teammates will never leave it. So I think the 10 fight rule is a good rule. Right, right on, man. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I, Cause I've asked, I've asked this a couple of times and with fans and other players that I've interviewed and for the most part, I, and I think it was when I was actually talking with Kyle Newber at one of the events down in, in Estero, he said, I think like at least be 15 because it's a 72 game season. I think 10 is just a touch too little just for, mm-hmm. it depends on, you know, it all depends on your ration. And of course that's just me talking as a fan um, yeah. from, from the side over here. I'm not the one throwing down. So of course it doesn't matter what I think, but I've always thought since yeah. it's a two game season, I feel like nobody's really fighting 20 times a year anymore in whatever yeah. regardless of what league i think 15 should be the max personally if you're going to put a rule in mm-hmm. but, um i mean do you think about it guys who do get 15 i mean they only get suspended for a certain amount you know right and i think that that i think their goal behind it is to stop the head injuries too and it's not to take fighting out of the game i think it's just more to preserve the players because i mean right. you look at all the information now compared to back then when people are fighting every night or fighting 20 times, you know, um, and you look at them after a season or even after a game, like think about how many times those tough, tough guys get hit in the head. Like, I mean, you watch a Kyle Newber versus Travis Howe fight. Those guys are, those guys aren't small guys no. and they're hitting hard. Every punch is landing. You think about how their head feels after a game. I mean, they got hard heads, but you think about how that's going to feel after a game or how you think of it you think of it after a season those two fight three or four times think about how they're going to feel after that but think about if they did it 15 times i mean right. i think i think 15 game 15 fights wouldn't be a bad rule but i also i also see why they do the 10 no absolutely um i i see the te- the 10 it's do i like it not really um but i think it's it's better than what like the like well you just said the ohl is 3 and i think yeah. The Quebec League, um, I think the it's Quebec one. League's ten. I think the Quebec League's ten. I, I and, unless thought, they changed it, Junior League. I thought, yeah, because it was after the, they got like held, like the government got involved and said, like after one fight, it's a suspension or something like that. Um, yeah, but that's a bit. That's a, that's a over excessive in my opinion, because then you got you got cheap shots that are going to happen. Yeah, I mean, and then you look at the dub and the dubs, the dub. They yeah. do whatever they want out there. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That would have been that would have been my ideal junior league to play in was there. I mean, I I, I wanted to play there. I mean, I couldn't make it happen, but that would have been my ideal spot to play. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and it's funny, you know, actually, when I was because of course I had looked into your stuff um, and your career. This is my really my first year following the ECHL. So of course, um, I don't know if you see on YouTube, but most of the fights that are from this year are typically posted by myself. And so yeah, oh man, I got to look for this Cole Frazier guy. Like you know, I never. I, I, cause I hadn't followed hockey in quite a bit. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was surprised by how young you are. You're 22 years old, correct? Yeah. I'm 23 next week. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I think I can't remember yeah. if, if Blatchman's got you beat, but you might be not, you know, you now might be the youngest person I've ever interviewed. Um, mm-hmm. which is funny cause normally I always interview guys who are older, but so coming up in the fighting role, I like to ask this for newer guys like, you know, like Blatchman or yourself, um is there any tough guy that you try to emulate yourself after like you might watch clips of like McGratton or Probert or something and you're like okay maybe I can do what they're doing to help me out in a fight or do you just kind of just go out there and just give it all give, give it all all you got excuse me 
Um, I mean, my agency, um, they represented some pretty tough guys in their day. Um, they represented uh, Chris Neal, Zach Ronaldo, Kyle Clifford, there guys you go. who can throw down. Um, but, uh, you know, they kind of gave me some tips um, going up through juniors. Um, and, you know, the big emphasis on it is more just kind of try to, like, play more defense and wait for your opportunities because if you go out there swinging, I mean, you're opening yourself up to some pretty intense blows. I mean, I've seen it firsthand. I mean, it happened to me in my first year in the coast. Um, It's not a fun feeling um, and you learn from it, but it happens and you try to, um, you try to learn from those things and just use those as more defense um, learning curves. Absolutely. Um, well, we'll dive into your, your ECHL career here, man. Uh, so you're in Allen and you actually fought and this dude's, this dude's tough as nails. You want to talk about a dude who's been doing it for years too. And I couldn't believe he was still playing this year, but you actually ended up fighting Garrett Klotz. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any, I don't know if there's footage out there of it at all, if it's on YouTube or not, but how, how was it fighting Garrett Klotz, man? He's just been a road warrior in terms of minor pro hockey. Um, it wasn't fun. <laughs> to say the least um yeah. but it also wasn't really an option um you know i had a guy on our team who was not very big uh, his name was Zane franklin um he had asked Klotz to square up and i was right there and i was watching it unfold and i'm like okay this guy's six eight 270 280 pounds and he's a freak um so I mean, I got to stand in there. I can stand in there. This guy's not going to be able to stand in there. He's too small. So I was like, well, if I just grab him and try to hold on for dear life, that's the best. I mean, I'm going to consider, consider that a win. I mean, this is a guy who's been doing it for years, fights guys like Wesker. And I'm like, so I drop my stuff and I grab him and I just hung on for dear life. And he almost knocked me out through my helmet. He was punching me on the top of my head and almost put me out. He's, he is out of everyone's weight class. I think the only guy that can really stand in there is probably noobs, how, or, uh, McKee. Those are the only guys that I think that are in that weight class. Yeah, man. Uh, Klotz is, fuck man, he's tough and he's still like jacked to the gills too. Mm -hmm. Um, And he's just, you know, he's got that, he's, been around the block a couple of times. So it's ain't his first rodeo when he's fighting. And um, yeah, I'm curious to see if he comes back next year, but what a, what a wild ride that must've been fighting him. Um, yeah. I mean, it happened. I mean, we almost fought in the bench in Rapid City too. I think there's footage <laughs> of that on Twitter, but he tried, I mean, I was trying to stick up for teammate again and he came into the bench and we were swinging across the benches. I mean, yeah. it was, that's, it was like jungle hockey bat. Like when that happened, it was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, like a page right out of slap shot there. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, another guy I'll ask you about is I was I, I'm, I'm mad I never got to see him play. He was in Florida the year right before we got down there, but yet he seemed like a loose cannon from what I could tell. But you fought Arvin Atwal, man. How was it fighting? Yeah. Him? Um, I mean, we kind of when I was in South Carolina, we bickered back and forth every game. Um, you know, um, I think we even fought before we actually fought on the ice, we fought across the stanchion in overtime. Um, and we were kind of going at it. And, um, I mean, I wasn't playing the overtime, so it was kind of a good trade off. Um, so he got kicked out of the game. I got kicked out of the game, but then, you know, that fight that him and I had, it was, it was, I mean, he kind of sucked with me from behind and I just turned around and just, I mean, we went at it. I still had one glove on, I mean, almost the entire fight. Um, but he, he was pretty tough. I, I've heard rumors about him being pretty tough. I mean, I think I did pretty well. I think we both kind of stood in there. He's, he's in my weight class. And there's not many times where I try to go above my weight class. I mean, I can fight the tough guys. I mean, I may not win, but I can stand in there and take them. But um, I think my weight class is definitely right there with him. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, well, you actually, so now you end up in Toledo. And, you know, this is the place you like to call home. And I've at the end, I got a couple of fan questions because I submitted, uh, you know, out to the Toledo walleye, like fan club mm-hmm. or fan page on Facebook. So we'll get to some fan questions yeah. at the end here. Um, 
So what were your initial thoughts of, of going into to, uh, to uh, Toledo? Because I've, I've seen their arena and man for an ECHL team, it seems like they just pack that fucking place on the regular. Oh yeah. Always every day. I mean, we have the best fans in the league. It's why I like playing there. Um, you know, there's not many coast teams that are going to have a fan base like that where you go in as, I mean, you've seen other ECHL teams. You've seen places like Tulsa or Wichita. They don't get many fans. Right. Um, even Allen. Allen doesn't get a lot of fans. But you go in there and it's packed every night. Every night. I mean, we had our two outdoor games this year and it was crazy. I think there was like almost 13,000 fans. And that, I mean, they in that setting, there's so much open space, but you can still hear the fans. It wasn't like we were playing just outside. There was a lot of fans. And, you know, anytime anything happens, whether it's a hit, a shot, a save, the crowd's going nuts. And, you know, it makes it a lot more fun to play in front of that. And, you know, all my teammates in Toledo can attest to that. It's one of a kind. I mean, when we're on the road, it's a lot tougher than it is at home because we have that. I mean, there are, there are seventh man on the ice. I mean, they really bring up the spirits for all of us, regardless if we're winning or losing. I mean, they're always engaged. Um, you know, um, that place when it's completely full playoffs was a whole other animal. I don't think there was a single empty seat and, you know, for the first, for, I mean, all the rounds, even the finals, they were loud regardless of winning or losing, and they never lost hope. And that's something that um, not many not many teams in the minors can say that they get. Um, but it's a, it's a hell of a time there. Yeah, no, it seems like it. And uh, I've, I've followed the uh, Toledo page for a bit there. I, I try to follow as many pages as I can to kind of familiarize myself with teams and uh, mm -hmm. for occasions like this where I could, uh, you know, if they have questions for a player, I can actually interview them and ask those questions. But, yeah, it seems like Toledo is always packed out. And one of the things that killed me, and I, I think I've talked to the guy who does it, but I just didn't know I was talking to him, but they actually throw walleye on the ice after either like a yep. goal or I think it might, it was either one of you or Mitchell Hurd's fights. A Toledo was, or a, a Toledo, a walleye was thrown on the ice and I about fell out of my chair laughing so hard, but that's like yeah. the pinnacle, like minor pro hockey die hard mentality. And I love it. Yeah. I mean, that's Robert Scott. And then there's another guy that does it too. Um, but yeah, he brings, my wife actually got a picture with the fish before he even threw it on the ice. Um, and they're not small walleye. Like these are, these are massive walleye he's thrown on the ice. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have never seen anything like that. I know Idaho, Idaho does something like it now, or I think they've done it for a while too, but they throw a steelhead and then uh, same with uh, Utah. They throw stuff on the ice now, but that, that, it wasn't like that when I was there. So I think that's a new thing this year. Um, so like they, when we were there, they scored, they threw, they call it feeding the bear and they throw a bunch of stuff too, but it's nothing compared to what like Toledo does. I mean, I think in the playoffs, they started throwing the octopus on the ice from the Red Wings. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I've never seen anything like it, but it was all time to say the least. No, yeah, like you said, even though I'm an Everblades fan, I got to appreciate. I, I always just appreciate just minor pro hockey, like diehard mentality, and like like you said, this this walleye that they're throwing, like you got to use two hands to chuck it over. And I mean, and it's funny because old, old boy's a couple rows up too. It's not like he's on the glass. Yeah. He's like could be like eight rows up at him. I mean, he's hucking this thing center ice, and it's great. Yeah, our playoff uh, video that they did for the playoff promo, they did a video from behind of him throwing it on the ice. Oh, right on. That's awesome. I love yeah. that they actually embrace it too. Cause you know, some arenas would be like, Oh no, don't do that. But I, I mean, you got yeah. to Toledo walleye. Yeah. Um, I mean, they embrace it, I think, but they only allow those two people who throw the fish to bring fish in. It's only yeah. those two people. Security, security knows who they are and they bring them in. So they've been doing it for years and I don't think they're ever going to stop. Yeah. That makes that That's probably best because I don't think uh, <laughs> if, you know, 14 people brought in walleye cleaning up fish all over the ice, ain't going to be fun. Um, yeah. Well, the fight that actually caught my eye from you at the beginning of the season, and I'm pretty sure you buckled him. I have it labeled as a TKO, but you, you got Tommy Apat pretty good. Um, 
Yeah. And it looked like one of his teammates was going to square off with you, but instead he took the fight. Um, what was kind of yeah. going on there and what transpired? Um, I mean, they were kind of just going back and forth between which one of them was going to fight me. Um, <laughs> I knew the one guy. Um, I played with him and Alan. Um, half, he's a good dude, but he, uh, the two of them, they were just sitting there. Um, after I got, after I hit that guy, I mean, they were just kind of like, who's going to fight me? And then um, one of them said, I got him. I'm going to fight him. And the other one was like, no, half, like I got, I got, so then we squared up and yeah, it was a good fight. I mean, um, I kind of just waited for my opportunity on, on when to grab and throw. I think the first one, the first one just barely missed. And the second one hit him on the button. Um, and it dropped him for sure. I, I felt the whole body just drop, but I mean, kudos to that guy. I mean, he went and played in the American League the rest of the year after. So, yeah, I've, I've always said there's nothing, ain't no shame in getting dropped in a fight. Everybody gets dropped, no matter no. who you are. Um, no, it happened to me when I was uh, when I was a rookie, and Alan fought. I stepped out of the penalty box, squared up with a guy, um, Joshua L. Tough, tough guy, and uh, he one punched me and just buckled my knees. I got back up, tried to keep fighting, but the refs are they're very uh, keen on getting in when someone gets buckled. So, yeah. Right. Um, well, I got to ask you about a teammate as well. And I was, I, I'd heard like stories about him. Cause I think he was in Florida two years prior, two or three years. Mitchell Hurd. Yeah. The Bay, the, the, the Toledo bash brothers over there. I love the combo of you and Mitchell Hurd. What's it like playing alongside him? Yeah. He's uh he's one of a kind, man. Um, he is skilled, but he can throw, he can throw with the best of them. He's not scared of anything. Um, you know, he's a good dude too. Um, like he's a good teammate to be around. Um, I mean, we were neighbors two doors down from each other. Um, he's passionate about the game and, uh, you know, it's nice to have a teammate who's always passionate and not having to be the only guy who has to throw down. Um, because when you got to do it yourself, it's, it's honestly, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to do when it's just you. Um, so it's nice to have a little, it's nice to have a little bit of help there too. Um, but he is, he is tough. He is real tough. And, you know, um, I learned a few things from him this year with all that stuff. Cause I mean, he's 10 years pro. Um, so he's seen a lot. He's been through a lot. He's fought a lot of tough guys, tough guys. But he gave me some tips this year too, so I'll be using those. But he's a he is he's crazy. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, well, and you know he does the same thing. I should say the same thing, but you both both kind of do it. Uh, like you know, after you, you get into a fight, you're at the home barn, and you know you're dropping the bucket, spinning it, you're, you're pumping the crowd up. When did that kind of start for you? Did that start in junior, or was that something you started developing in pro? Because I, I was only think, Toledo. Oh, only Toledo, really. Yeah, I mean, you can't do it when you don't have any fans. Yeah, I mean, that's true, I guess. <laughs> kind of look, kind of look dumb if you do it when you're on the road or away. Um, when you have fans or don't have any fans, I mean, in juniors we didn't get any fans. Um, right. I did it once in juniors, um, and then it never did it after because there was really no response. But that feeling that you get as a player after that fight, being able to control that crowd and get them going and get that momentum flowing in the building and the energy up, you know it goes a long way. I mean, the crowd is so responsive in Toledo, um, especially after a fight. Um, because I mean, when you fight, I mean, the crowd's looking at the one and only thing going on the ice, which is the fight. And then after the fight, they're looking at their hometown guy. They're not looking at the other guy. So you can get that crowd going and that momentum shifts. I mean, if we're down, if we're down and we get in a, and one of us get in a fight and we get that crowd going. Um, I mean, the momentum completely shifts the crowd's going nuts and they stay nuts and you know, it brings our spirits up on the bench and makes it a little bit easier to get that extra step and get that step going. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, that's something I like to ask guys too, because some folks don't believe, you know, that fighting can swing a game and it doesn't always work. It's not saying just because no. you fight that you're going to go out and score next shift, you know, mm -hmm. but does that, does that definitely play a factor for you guys on the bench for the rest of the game? You know, knowing oh, that big oh, time for sure, you know, drop this guy, and we're going to go out there and get it done. Yeah. And I mean, you know, like you said, it doesn't always work, um, but that's hockey. I mean, you got to try everything. I mean, regardless, I mean, if it's not your night, it's not your night. It's how it's going to be. Every team has it, but 
if there's one thing that you can change and and that's that helps the momentum of the game and turns things around whether it's a big hit a big fight a big goal i mean you're going to try to do it it's part of it's part of the game but for us on the bench in Toledo i mean when that crowd starts going it gets all of us going yeah for sure um well, you brought up the outdoor game earlier, and you actually had a fight in the outdoor game versus Riley McKay. What brought that fight about? Um, he was asking our captain to fight and kind of messing at our, messing with our captain. You know, the guys play almost a thousand games in professional hockey, um, so you can't do that without having to answer the bell. Um, so, I mean, that was one of those instances where you're sticking up for your teammate, and where that aspect of fighting is never going to come out of the game. I mean, you go after your skilled guy or whatever, and um, you're going to have to answer to someone who can. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that Henny can't. I mean, he doesn't need to. He's right. 36 years old, and he's played 960-some-odd games in professional hockey. I mean, he doesn't have to do that stuff. That's not what he's here for. Um, that's not what he was there for. I mean, he was there for to be our leader and to score goals and to make make plays and um a guy like me who's there to stick up for him and protect him that's my job and you know i'm willing to do that whenever i need to for sure well the last fight i'll ask you about before we move on and i'll get to some of the fan questions for you and i'll get you on your way man um but you fought darian skio of allen and he's a tough customer uh i followed him for a little bit i had a buddy who watched him play in the dub um so he's been on my radar for a bit but how was it fighting him it seems like he just throws fucking hammers yeah, you know, um, I kind of pride myself on that fight. You know, um, a guy who's kind of out of my weight class. Um, he's older than me. He has more experience. Um, he is most likely tougher. Um, but, you know, I stood in there and I and I played defense. I mean, I think he hit me with one good one. But I think at the beginning of the fight, I think we both got each other with some good punches. I mean, I got him with some quick short lefts. But it was more of a defense fight for me. Um, I mean, when you're at home, you're, I mean, you're not really trying to always win that fight. You're trying to more or more or less just try not to lose it. And with a guy like that, um, that's someone who you don't want. I mean, that's not someone I'm going to go toe to toe with. That's not, that's not smart for me. Right. I mean, that's someone who could easily knock me out and hurt me. Um, but for myself, I think just being defensive in that, in that, in a fight like that, it's all about the defense and preserving yourself because you take so many blows from that guy. I mean, there's so many opportunities for head for head problems. And, um, it's how you have a long career. You know, you want to be able, you want to be that player who's able to have that long career. If you're um, if you're sitting in there just taking blows, I mean, your career's not going to last very long. So that's a fight that I pride myself on when it comes to defensively uh, fighting because it was all defense for me in that fight. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, you know, when I interviewed Chris Nyland, and you know, if for folks listening, I encourage you to go check out some Chris Nyland clips if you're uh, if you're an ECHL fan, and you've never seen any, but very undersized guy from Montreal, and he said the same thing. He said I couldn't go toe to toe with these guys because I wouldn't have had as long of a career as I I, I did. So it's it's true. You know, it's a war of attrition when it comes to hockey, and not only just playoffs, but when you start fighting and you got shoulders and hands, and you're, you got to worry about your face. So. Um, I know some, everybody wants every single fight to be tasker versus send, but it's just not going to happen. It's no, and it's not smart. No, it's not. It's it's really not. I mean, it's, yeah, it's great for the fans. It's great for, it's great for content, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's a good way to, it's a good way to have CTE when you're older. I mean, CTE is a big thing. And I mean, I think about it all the time. I mean, I've had my head, I've had my head injuries. I've had my concussions they're not fun and they're hard to recover from. And each one you get that is after your first one, it's a longer recovery time. And, you know, I've had some buddies who have had to retire from the game because of concussions. Um, And it's a scary thing to think about because now you see all this stuff coming out with CTE and everything. And, you know, it's scary. You look at all these enforcers from back in the day when there wasn't information on this stuff and you see guys, um, all the time battling all these different sorts of uh, um, mental problems when it comes to uh, mental disorders, when it comes to depression and anxiety and um, drug abuse and substance abuse, you know, it's, it's a big, 
it's a big problem. And I think that they're doing a better job addressing it now. Um, and it definitely makes me feel safer and me feel better about it because if I need the help, I can get it. Um, I mean, I'm good now, but who knows what's, what's say 10 years down the road when all this stuff, when I retire and all this stuff settles down and starts to develop, you know, um, I mean, I only pray and hope that, um, I'm good and everything's good, but it's one of those things that you got to think about and preserve yourself. That's why the defensive part of fighting is definitely a big thing. Yeah. It's definitely important to be like a technical fighter. Like you mm-hmm. said, you can't just go out there and just swing and toe to toe every time. It's just, it's, you're just not going to have a long career and it's not good for you. Um, yeah. And at the end of the day, while I, I, you know, I enjoy fights, I post fights, this entire podcast is dedicated to fights, but I never, you never want to see anybody get injured or seriously yeah. struggling after hockey or anything like that. It's more so just to appreciate like, like what you do. Man. Oh, you're, for sure. Yeah. You're going to war for your teammates, man. I mean, there's nothing more admirable than that, in my opinion. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, the, we'll kind of, that kind of wraps up this year, at least. And I know you're going to go back to Toledo next season, but you actually ended up in the uh, Kelly Cup finals. And unfortunately, you came up short versus Florida. But how was that experience for you, man? Um, I mean, it was a great experience. Um, I didn't play after game six in the first round, um, uh, just because the numbers, we got some guys back and, um, you know, coach did what he, what he, what he did. And, um, you know, he put in the guys that we thought we were going to win it. And, um, you know, with everything, I mean, everything happens for a reason. I mean, it's something that we're all going to learn from something that we all really wanted. I mean, it was heartbreaking sitting in that room after game five. Um, I mean, we were all just crushed. I mean, not many times are you going to be able to say that you're in the finals again. Um, who knows? It could be some guys last time. I mean, hopefully we make a run for it again this year. Um, and I think we'll be able to do that um, with our coach and our staff and the guys that we're putting together again. I know that we have some returners. Um, I know some guys have left, but, you know, um, for me, it was my first playoffs. Um, I hadn't been, I mean, like I said, my first year ended early because of COVID. Um, and then my second year, um, I didn't make the playoff roster in Utah. But, you know, it was my first playoffs, and I got those six games under my belt and learned what it was really like to play playoff hockey. It's a whole other animal. It's not regular season hockey. It is not, it's not anything like regular season hockey. It is a completely different uh, atmosphere is a completely different game. It's way faster, way harder, way more physical. And, you know, I got to see that all the way through and regardless of if I played or not, you know, it was a great experience and I learned a lot from it. And, uh, I mean, it sucked not being able to be out there with my teammates, um, in those last, in those last, um, series, but, you know, I, I learned from them watching and, um, seeing what it's like in the room and everything, but um, hopefully we make a run for it this year and, and I'm, uh, and I'm in there for the whole playoffs. Absolutely, man. Yeah, it was a, it was a great playoff series between Florida and Toledo. Uh, I got to watch it up here in North Carolina and we were, uh, of course, you know, going for the Everblades, but it was overall a great series. And um, I, I had a lot of fun watching it. And I, like I said, um, seeing the Toledo fans just going crazy up there during the playoffs was pretty cool. Um, so speaking of the fans, we'll get into some of the fan questions here and it's just a couple, but, uh, Chris asked, what is your favorite walleye memory so far? Mm. No, honestly, this whole last season, that was my favorite yeah. walleye memory, just regardless of the fact that we win or lose, um, you know, being around the boys and being around the team for, um, for as long as we were and being able to, I mean, we, went, we got home, I think I got home June 20th, you know, it was a long season. You make some, some friendships and some memories that are going to last your whole life. Um, you know, and being able to play with that crowd behind us and those fans, you know, that this whole season was my favorite walleye memory. There isn't one specific thing that I could pinpoint and say, you know, this was my favorite memory, you know, the outdoor, everything from game one to the outdoor games to the last game of the season to playoffs, you know, every single thing played a part in me thinking that this season was like the best season ever, you know? Yeah. Minus not being able to come out with a victory. Right. 
Um, Lakeith asks, <laughs> so he says, on the last second shot against Fort Wayne, was the shot one of the best, most accurate in his career, or did you just throw it at the net? I just threw it at the net. You know, it was. A, <laughs> I mean, there was like, I think there was like 0.6 seconds left or something like that on the clock. Um, you know, the puck was just there. I mean, I figured I'd throw a prayer up. I mean, it's kind of like a Hail Mary. I just shot it at the net and it went in. You know, that was a, that was a big game for all of us. You know, uh, Henny scoring with a minute and a half left and then, um, then that happening as well. You know, it was a big, it was a big game. And I think, uh, I think the Fort Wayne co- coach even lost a little bit. I think the fan got a souvenir from him. I think they got a broken clipboard. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so Kyle, asked, well, he asked, how does Toledo compare to other fan bases? And I think we've, we've covered that. Um, yeah. We also ask, what do you like to do around town uh, in your downtime around Toledo? Um, well, I mean, um, my wife's there with me and my dogs. And uh, so, I mean, whenever we can get them out running around. I think that's kind of like, we, I mean, I like being able to do some stuff with my, with my wife and my dogs. Um, but uh, with the boys, when it comes to the boys, I mean, we like going golfing when we can. I mean, golf season short, just like it is up in Canada, you know, there's only a certain amount of time that you can golf before it gets too cold. Um, but, you know, I think that's, that's kind of what we like to do. I mean, Um, we'll get together as teammates we all live in the same complex so it's easy to get together Um, and then same with golf I mean we'll go golfing when we can but a lot of the times we're just at the rink I mean the rink is such a good spot for all of us it's got everything we need I mean it's got a gym it's got a sauna I mean we got ping pong we have table hockey got everything there and uh, as a team that's kind of like what we like to do you know hang out there go back to the apartments hang out there go golf Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Well, man, I think that's it for the questions. I appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast and uh, give us a little inside info on your career and what it's like fighting some of these guys and how it is playing out in Toledo. And it's a great time. Yeah, Yeah, of course. It was a pleasure coming on the podcast, getting to talk. And, you know, we can do this again sometime, maybe after the season's done, and catch up about how this last season went. Yeah, for sure. Um, Well, man, take it easy. I appreciate you again. Yeah, you too, of course. Yeah, have a good one. You too.